Catch me if you can, this man once jokingly posted on his Facebook account whilst being on the run for the Australian police. He was named Target Number One because he flooded the country with endless supplies of drugs for years. Australia's Criminal Intelligence Agency estimated that this earned him the staggering amount of around $1.5 billion a year. For over two decades, he lived a life of luxury and seemingly felt untouchable. But then, he finally got what he asked for. He got caught. Though that's definitely not all there is to his story. This is the story of the capture of Hakan Aik, Australia's biggest kingpin. Hakan's arrest in Istanbul was a culmination of many months of preparation between the Australian and Turkish authorities. According to Turkish Interior Minister Mr. Yerlikaya, this operation, named Operation Cage, was specifically aimed at the Australian Comanchero bikey gang, once led by now slain Mick Howie. The Comancheros were an integral part of Hakan Ayik's criminal organization, but more on that later. The entire operation took place on the 2nd of November 2023 and was well documented. All across Istanbul, highly trained police units raided several homes, arresting almost all of their targets in one go. Most of these men truly believed they were untouchable. For long, their corrupt contacts allowed them to live a comfortable life in Turkey, but now this was no longer possible. Due to them feeling untouchable, many seemed shocked during their arrest. For example, one of them was having a peaceful meal at his dinner table when he was arrested. It goes to show that Operation Cage was planned and executed very well, leading to remarkable results. In total, there were over 37 men arrested, an estimated $250 million worth of cash, bank accounts, luxury goods such as watches, real estate, company shares, as well as 23 vehicles were seized. And the Turkish authorities decided to do something rather unexpected with these vehicles. Australian Federal Police Acting Deputy Commissioner for Crime, Grant Nichols, was ecstatic with the arrests made, and especially with that of public enemy number one, Hakan Aik. In a press conference, he went on to say, this proves that one of the biggest mistakes organized criminals can make is to assume they are untouchable anywhere in the world. They may have believed that they were untouchable. They may have believed that they could evade justice. That's just not the case. Quickly, back to the 23 seized vehicles, of which the majority belonged to Hakan himself. What did the Turkish authorities do with them? Well, turn them into police cars, fitted with police stickers and flashing lights, the whole package. Interior Minister Mr. Yerlika proudly posted a video of all the vehicles lined up. The video shows many Mercedes vehicles, Audis, a Ferrari, a Bentley, a Range Rover, a Porsche, all top-of-the-line models. Though there were also a bit more mundane vehicles, such as a Volvo, Skoda, Nissan, and Peugeot. According to the minister, this wasn't just some sort of promotional video. In his message, he said, From now on, these vehicles will be at the disposal of our police and in service of our nation, not criminal organizations. Meaning, all the cars will actually be used to actively patrol the streets of Istanbul. Can you imagine being pulled over by police in a Bentley? Well, it did cause some backlash of people saying that it would be better to sell the vehicles and purchase normal police cars instead. You can imagine that the maintenance of a Ferrari or a Bentley is more costly than a regular Skoda. All in all, the entire operation was quite the parade. So what caused Hakan to be such a big fish and the most wanted man of Australia for over two decades? To better understand that, we have to go all the way back to the beginning of the 2000s in Australia. Hakan born in 1979, started getting involved in drug smuggling on a small scale in his early 20s. Despite seeing his own family members struggle with drug addictions, he was determined to build an empire, lured by the immense profits to be made. The market for drugs in Australia is very lucrative. Since Australia is situated relatively remote and drugs are harder to come by, it reflects in the price. For example, a gram of coke on the streets in the Netherlands or Belgium costs about 50 euros or 80 Australian dollars. The median price of that same gram costs a staggering 214 euros or 350 Australian dollars in Australia, according to the yearly report of the Ecstasy and Related Drugs Reporting System, also known as the EDRS, meaning the price is over four times higher compared to the Netherlands and Belgium. We know that the Netherlands, as well as Belgium, has some of the world's largest ports and are a hub for drug trafficking. 
but it goes to show that whoever is capable of getting drugs into Australia is set for a good payday. Hakan was one of those people. By 2008, he had a thriving smuggling business and focused more so on smuggling synthetic drugs. With the proceeds of his business, Hakan spent a life living in luxury and opulence. New sports cars, very expensive jewelry, you name it. To come across as a legitimate businessman, he bought several real estate properties and businesses in his hometown Sydney, as well as Canberra. While Hakan built an empire in the drug trade, several of his friends from high school now held high ranks in the Comancheros Outlaws motorcycle gang. One of those friends was Duax Dax Ngakuru, the supreme commander of the Comancheros. Hakan did not intend to become part of the Comancheros. However, he did realize that starting an alliance with them could be useful for growing his own business. Hakan Aik is not publicly a member of the Comancheros. However, he does have a lot of influence over what happens in the club whilst keeping a low profile, a 2008 NSW Crime Commission intelligence file stated. Hakan was one of the first drug smugglers that gladly made use of bikey gangs, as they are called in Australia, to distribute his drugs across the country. As his empire was expanding, the interest of the Australian police was growing as well. Though it was not a busted shipment that prompted further investigation. No, it was the purchase of a money counting machine that prompted the New South Wales police to further investigate Hakan. In that same year, 2008, Hakan was waiting for a flight at Sydney airport when he received a notification on his phone. It was an alert from his surveillance cameras he had at home, which just started filming a small group of police officers. Hakan sent some of his intimidating buddies from the Comancheros down to take a look. And just like that, the police operation ended prematurely. On the 5th of March, 2008, a Piper Aztec landed at the Jandakot Airport in Western Australia. What pilot Jameson Santos did not see was the dozen police officers awaiting the arrival of his airplane. The officers ordered Santos and his fellow passenger, Mikalizi, to get out of the airplane. Detective Morish noticed a black duffel bag in the cargo area. Upon opening it, he immediately said, ah, we have an issue here. The duffel bag was full of drugs. In total, the officers found 22 kilograms of meth and 30,000 MDMA tablets, totaling up to $8 million worth of drugs. It was the biggest drug bust in Western Australian history and a day for law enforcement officers to remember. Upon further investigation, police revealed that Mikalizi was a drug runner for the Comancheros, and this was highly likely to be a shipment owned by Hakan. The flight from Bankstown to Jandakot took 15 hours in total. The men had made themselves suspicious after Mikalizi refused to leave the airplane during a fuel stop, despite airport protocol. Had he gotten out, they would have most likely succeeded. Hakan may have ended the police operation that day when he sent his Comancheros buddies to his home, but after that busted shipment, law enforcement only got more determined to investigate him. They decided to launch a new operation called Operation Hoffman. During the thorough investigation, they saw Hakan in the presence of Chinese triad members linked to the Sam Gore Syndicate, which was one of the biggest and wealthiest crime organizations in the world once ran by Tse Chi Lo. I've recently made a video about him too, make sure to check it out. Having a relationship with such triads opened up a wide range of business possibilities for Hakan. These triads often own large Chinese factories that manufacture huge amounts of precursor chemicals needed to make synthetic drugs. However, Hakan refused to be dependent on one particular ally for his resources. He also had Indian allies. In late 2009, selfies of Hakan arose, which pictures him standing in a pharmaceutical laboratory in India. At the same time, police also came across multiple documents outlining purchases of large amounts of chemicals needed to make drugs. The evidence suggested that he was setting up his own industrial-scale synthetic drug laboratory, cutting out the middleman. Week by week, investigators managed to uncover more information about Hakan. They also found out that Hakan had lots of corrupt port and airport workers, as well as a corrupt government official that shared crucial police intelligence with him and a prison officer that passed messages from Hakan to jailed associates. Some of his corrupt contacts were arrested immediately after police found out. One of them had over 40 kilograms of meth in his home during his arrest. It truly went to show that Hakan had risen rapidly within the underworld and was a seriously big player. It could be said that 2009 was the year that Operation Hoffman led to the arrests of the low-hanging fruit that put them on a trail to the bigger guys. Because in 2010, police started to take down the key figures of Hakan's organization 
one by one. Hakan was on a vacation in Hong Kong when one of his most trusted associates was arrested. This made him decide that it was too dangerous to travel back to Australia, causing him to flee to Europe and the Middle East. The Facebook gangster could not resist the urge to taunt the Australian police via his Facebook page, saying, catch me if you can. Well, the hunt was on because an Interpol arrest warrant went out in July 2010 and Hakan Aik was now officially a wanted man. Two months later, Hakan found himself in great trouble. He attempted to get into Cyprus when he was pulled over to the side by border patrol due to suspicion that arose concerning his passport. Hakan, however, managed to escape after allegedly paying off border officials. He almost got what he wished for. At the end of December 2010, he was less lucky. News broke that Cypriot police had arrested Hakan in their country. Police back home in Australia were obviously delighted to hear the news, but they were in for a treat. Instead of extraditing Hakan, Cyprus granted him bail. Hakan immediately fled again and was nowhere to be found anymore. Surprise, surprise, right? What do you think? Was it rightful to grant him bail? Or did he bribe someone to let him off easy? Let me know in the comments. Either way, authorities back in Australia decided to seize several properties and businesses of Hakan in the hopes of applying pressure, but it was to no avail. At this point in time, Hakan made so much money that a few million more or less did not bother him. He just kept bringing in large quantities of drugs into Australia, even whilst on the run. Meanwhile, multiple official sources suggested that Hakan was nearing a billion dollars in net worth. This was estimated on the basis of some seized shipments belonging to him, including a 2014 shipment of 1.9 tons of MDMA and 850 kilograms of methamphetamine worth an estimated $1.6 billion. This was later described by then Prime Minister Tony Abbott as Australia's second biggest drug haul. A year later, police seized another shipment worth over 100 million euros. Then after many years of silence and to everyone's surprise, Mr. Facebook gangster exposed himself on social media again. In a blurry video on the Instagram account of the King Cross Hotel in Istanbul, a man can be seen through the reflection. He is dressed in black, filming the logo of the hotel, and seemingly without having a clue, also capturing himself. After further investigation, it was deemed to be Hakan Aik. The man that had been on the run for years was apparently to be found in Turkey. One thing led to another. After conducting some digital investigation, Hakan could be seen on a picture of an event in Turkey Though they slightly altered his face to hide him, his hairline and body type gave him away. The name of the hotel also rang a bell for investigators. King's Cross in Sydney has a long association with bikies, strip clubs, and crime bosses. Turkish business records also revealed the hotel's owner was also called Hakan, albeit with the last name of Rhys. This, it turned out, was another potential clue. Rhys translated from Turkish to English into chief or commander, is it possible that Hakan Aik has changed his name to denote his perceived power and prestige? The logo of the King's Cross Hotel is a crown after all. If that was not enough evidence, official identity and birth records provided more proof. It revealed that Hakan Rees once had a different name and had renounced his Australian citizenship in 2019, leaving only his Turkish passport. He must have felt untouchable and invincible in Turkey for about 10 years long, knowing Australian police could not directly get to him. Well, fast forward to 2023. We now know that the curtain has fallen for Hakan. It may not have been Australian police who directly arrested him, but their persistence and collaboration with Turkey definitely helped. Thus far, it remains unknown if and when Hakan will be extradited, as well as to which country. You may think that it would be obvious that Australia would do anything in its power to have him sat in an Australian court, though that's not necessarily the case. Remember, Hakan renounced his Australian citizenship. Therefore, Australian authorities are leaning towards making the decision to have Hakan prosecuted in Turkey as a Turkish citizen, rather than pursue an extradition, which would be accompanied by a long and tedious process. It must be said that the United States want Hakan as well. In 2021, he was charged in an FBI indictment regarding the Anom encrypted devices and faces a maximum of 20 years. All in all, this cleanup begs the question, is Turkey next in line when it comes to cleaning their streets and getting rid of the world's most notorious criminals hiding there? For example, if we look at Dubai, another place where notorious criminals like to reside, they've been cleaning their streets for the last few years. 
arresting criminals that have arrest warrants out for them and extraditing them out of their city. This partly came due to pressure from other countries who saw their prime targets live freely in Dubai, as well as Dubai wanting to get rid of their safe haven image. The same pressure is being applied to Turkey. Countries are not happy with Turkey's passport program that readily offers criminals easy access into the country for a large sum of money. Some might say these arrests are nothing more than a facade, just evidence that Turkey can use to say, look, we are actively battling crime in our country. Meanwhile, there are still plenty of criminals living their lives there. For now, they have successfully swept multiple criminals off their streets. Only time will tell whether they will keep on doing so. If you have enjoyed this video, please be sure to leave a like, a comment, and don't forget to subscribe. It takes a second, but it immensely helps the channel.